so <clears throat> now that we have the basic formula for JavaScript down, um, we're going to expand in a couple directions. And we sort of already started that last class. First of all, we're going to spend a good amount of time looking at having our JavaScript interact with forms because forms supply the input data to do a lot of stuff. So especially with AJAX um, applications, um, a lot of what you do is based on what the user has entered into a form. So uh, it's important for that reason. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to look at um, more aspects of the JavaScript language statements such as if statements and loops and things uh, of that nature. So, we left off last time, we did a basic um, Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. And it did its job, but if we didn't enter a number in, it blew up. And I forget exactly what it did. If it said not a number, I think it did. Um, or something similarly not good. Um, one thing I try to emphasize in all my classes is the difference between code that works and code that's good. All right. Um, there's a couple factors that sort of make the difference between code that works and code that's good. Code that works isn't, you know, A plus code, all right? Code that works might be B minus or C code, all right? What makes it then A plus code is one of the, one of the things is how easy it is to modify, how well thought out it is so that if something changes, how easy is it to go in and make the change? The other thing that is critical is how fault tolerant it is. In other words, if something goes wrong, um, how clear is it to the user what happened and what action they need to take and so on and so forth. So those are two things that are, are critical. And right now, well, our code's kind of small to worry about maintainability really at this point. But um, fault tolerance is definitely the one thing that is an issue. So if we look at this, If we forget to enter in a value, or we enter in some nonsense, it doesn't work, obviously, but it doesn't particularly tell the user in any understandable way what went wrong. two times. I'm going to 
one thing, and in another case you want to do something else, that's, uh, uh, that's the role of an if statement. So we're going to put an if statement in here to do this calculation, but only do it some of the time.
braces. If it's not true, I do this part, the part within, the else part. So if statements always have a condition which, are, which is either true or false, if it's true, we do this part, else, otherwise, we do this part. This is another case of using those braces to group things together. We saw that we used them together to indicate the beginning and end of a function. We also use them to separate an if statement into the true part and the false part. All right, so I can make my condition more complex by saying or, and that's the two vertical lines, is not a number and put that expression in. I mean, this is almost like a double negative. But this part of the condition is true if the value of the text box, because that's what this represents, is not a number. So if I put garbage in there, just hit any old keys, then is not a number will be true. Or if I leave it completely blank, is also true. So it should catch more errors this time. Again, the vertical lines, sometimes called the pipes, are an indication um, of an or. In other words, if either this part of the condition or this part of the condition is true, then the whole if statement is true and we do this part. Otherwise, we do this part. So let's save it and test it. So, I put nothing in there, it gives me an error. I put garbage in there, it still gives me an error. It doesn't try to do the calculation. And if I put a legitimate number in there, it does do the calculation. Now, the, about the only thing that we need to test for is what if we put spaces in. If we put spaces in, that still gives me an error. All right? Let me rephrase that. It doesn't give me my error message. It gives me misleading results. All right? So how do we fix that? Well, Each time 
I made a change to this, I tested all the conditions again. I tested a case where there was nothing in there. I tested a case where there was only spaces in there. I tested the case when there was garbage in there. And then finally I tested the case where there was a legitimate number in there. All right. A mistake that I commonly see people make, and I've even seen more experienced developers make, is let's say I put in the is not a number function to handle things like if someone puts letters in there. Developers will test that part without going back and retesting the other stuff, the other parts of it. And that's a mistake. It's a mistake because you never know what you're going to break when you go in and start changing code. Now you can be pretty careful and you, you know, you shouldn't break something if your code is written well, but there's always a possibility that a new piece of functionality you add could break some old piece of functionality that was working. Therefore, it's important to thoroughly test after you make any sort of changes to it. Any questions about this? Let's review this. We have if document is equal to an empty string. After we get rid of the leading and trailing spaces. That's what the trim function does. So if there's spaces at the beginning or spaces at the end, it gets rid of those. So if I typed in five spaces, of course, it will get rid of all five spaces. If I type in five spaces and an A, it will get rid of the five spaces and an A. Oh, I'm sorry, and, and leave just the A. So after I've trimmed that text box, is there nothing left in it? In other words, was there only spaces in the text box? If that is true, then this half of the if statement is true. I also test to see if the value of the text box is not a number. All right? If it's something else other than, other than a number. And if it is, then that part is true. Because these are connected with an or, if either part, if either one of these two conditions is true, then the whole condition is true. And we do what's between the braces here. If both parts are false, if neither of the two parts are true, then we do the else. So, in this case, if this if statement is true, then we have an error. Display our error message. Otherwise, go ahead and actually do the calculation. Now again, it's not always like that. You write the if statement the way that makes sense. You know, um, you could write it so that if conditions are true, you do the calculation, and if the conditions are false, then you have an error. It just depends on the particular problem that you're trying to solve, um, which, which sort of direction you go with that. All right, now the next thing that we talked about is to go and actually make this look different. Depending on whether they got it correct or they got it incorrect. How do you suppose we're going to do that? How are we going to make that look different? Just the phrase look different should point you, should nudge you a little bit in the right direction. Because if I'm talking about making it look different under one case or another, what am I talking about using? One option is, again, going back to the if scenarios, that if it is an empty string or if it is not a number, you could say assign a certain class. Okay. So that's very true. Let's 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 give a little bit higher overview though of, of that. Let, let's look at this from a little bit higher. 
changing. Well, the style. The style, the CSS. All right. Now, I could do that a couple different ways, right? I could change the attributes of it individually. We've already seen how we can make things appear and disappear. All right. Could we change the color of it? Absolutely. In fact, let's go and do that. Let's go and change the color of the text depending on whether they got it, whether there's an error or not. So, I'm going to go in and say, if there's an error,
I talk about how there's two parts of the dropdown. There's what the user sees, and then there is the script, uh, the value that the script sees. All right. So I'm going to go in and. my screen. 
script so that well, I could do this a couple different ways, but I could put an if statement in here. How do you suppose we're going to get the value of what option the user chose? Well, first thing we need to do is we need to point to this element. How do we point to an element within our JavaScript code? Well, document. ID for this, ddconv, all right, so that part you should know, all right, because that's how we point to anything on the page. When we did the menus, that's how we pointed to the menus that we either showed or hit, all right, when we pulled the value from a text box, that's how we did it, all right, so we should have that. So, if that's equal, well, I can't just say if that's equal to that. I have to say what aspect of it. And to, to see what, what option the user has selected, I test the value attribute. So, if that value attribute equals F to C, then... I can just do the same conversion that I've done before. Otherwise, Streamline this code a little bit, but I'm not worried about that right now. So enter temperature, enter type of conversion, answer will go here. So if I enter 32 degrees and I do Fahrenheit to centigrade, it should show zero degrees there. All right. If I put in 100 degrees and say centigrade to Fahrenheit, it should say 212 degrees here.
212 degrees. Now, notice I'm going to go through and I'm going to repeat my other calculations. All right? Because I changed something. You know, changing code is like voiding the warranty on something, right? It's like you don't know what you're going to end up with. So you better go back and retest it to make sure that it worked. So even though the change I made looked innocent and should have only corrected the problem I've having, I was having and shouldn't have messed anything else up, I'm still going to go back and test it. Because as code gets larger, the interactions between pieces of code can become more complex, and I'm liable to have may, uh, changed something that caused a ripple effect in other parts of the program. So I want to go and test that. Then finally, of course, if I put in some bogus value, it gives me the error message. And it doesn't matter what I've selected as my option here, it still gives me that error message. Now, to be sure, the thing to keep in mind is that I'm projecting this on the screen. All right? So if I was working on this by myself, I probably would have the, the, the size of the text this big or so, give or take. Now, a good rule of thumb is that a function ought to be able to be displayed in its entirety on one screen. Why do you think I say that? Why does it matter how big a function is? When I say something is a good idea, what am I really saying? That it helps the maintainability of the code. The browser doesn't care how big your function is. You can have a thousand line function and the browser will ex execute it perfectly. All right. The problem that gets into is if you go in and make a change to the code. And if you go in and make a change to the code, how easy is it for you to find the piece of code that you need to change? How easy is it to change one thing without having a ripple effect and changing something else, etc. So the reason I say it's a good idea to have a function fit on one page completely is because I want to be able to wrap my head around the whole thing. If I have to scroll up and down to see parts of the function, then there's a chance I'm going to have mentally a disconnect and I'm not going to realize something's going on or whatever. If it all fits on one screen, then I should be able to wrap my head around it. Now, what if it does get to be too big as this function is approaching? All right. Well, one thing I could do is I could look at ways to make it more efficient. I could probably simplify this code a little bit. All right. Another thing I could do is I could divide it further into more functions. All right. And we'll talk about that next time, what the real advantages of that are, because there's a few different advantages. And then we'll talk about the mechanics of how we could go about doing that. Any questions about this? I'll post this example. Be sure you go through this example between now and class time.